Hi, I'm Marvin, and I'm a junior with Marvin. I'm Eric, I'm also a junior. I'm Lori, and I'm also a junior. I'm Kevin, and I'm also a junior. I'm Angela, and I'm a senior. I just saw the camera, and what's the name of the school? The whole High Technology High School. Um, my name is Karen Bliss, and I'm from Virginia Military Institute. I'm Dan Connors, I'm from IBM Research. I'm Kelly Black. Amanda Babson with the National Park Service. Grace Bergman with the Service. You all will have 15 minutes to make your presentation. Um, I'll signal you when you have two minutes remaining. Uh, then there'll be some questions from the judging panel, and then you'll be done. Please go ahead and get started. Good morning, and thank you for meeting with us today. We're team 8878 from High Technology High School, and this is our solution to the 2017 Moody's Mega Math Challenge. By establishing the National Park Service, or NPS, the American government ensured that the natural beauty of this nation would be set aside for future generations to enjoy. However, the rapidly accelerating rate of climate change threatened these parks and the natural beauty of the nation as a whole. In particular, coastal units are directly at risk. The models that we developed seek to analyze exactly how vulnerable these national parks are and how potential risks can be addressed. First, we are tasked with predicting sea level changes over the periods of 10, 20, and 50 years, as well as assigning a risk rating to each of our projections. Then, we were asked to consider both the severity as well as the frequency of climate-related events in order to assign a Climate Vulnerability Score, or CVS, to each national park. Finally, we were challenged to predict long-term changes in NPS visitorship in order to better inform future budgeting decisions. Rising sea levels pose an immediate threat to the health of coastal units. While there are many factors that influence sea level rise, or SLR, we have determined that it is primarily caused by three main factors. First, we have the global factors, which include thermal expansion and glacier meltwater. Then, local variations in SLR are caused by land uplift, which can be either tectonic activity and or isostatic rebound. Finally, by summing the three factors, we're able to generate the final SLR value for each national park. <coughs> we will now examine each factor individually. We will begin by analyzing thermal expansion. Thermal expansion is a direct part of global warming. Rising temperatures causes water to heat up, and as water heats up, it expands. In order to quantify thermal expansion, two <coughs> equations were developed, which, when set equal to each other, allowed us to solve for delta D, or the change in sea level. The first equation that we developed modeled change in volume as a function of initial volume and change in temperature. Change in temperature was modeled by performing an exponential regression on stored temperature data. Initial volume was replaced with surface area <coughs> times initial depth. Now, initial depth was determined to be 1,000 meters, or the lower limit of the thermal climb. The thermal climb is a layer of the ocean where energy and temperature changes can occur. The second equation that we developed to model change in volume was surface area times change in depth. Now, by assuming that surface area remains constant as volume increases, we were able to set the two equations equal to each other, cancel out surface area, and rearrange to solve for delta D or the change in sea level due to thermal expansion. The second major contributing factor to global sea level rise is glacier meltwater. So each year, the ice sheets and glaciers at both poles melt and contribute an excess amount of water to the global ocean volume. So first, in order to calculate this change in global glacier volume, we conducted a third order polynomial regression on the yearly change in thickness from 1975 to 2016. Then, Using this regression, uh, we could then calculate the specific volume in any specific year of our global uh, glacier volume. So we assume that the global glacier volume could be represented by a rectangular prism with a height of 2.1 kilometers, which is the average height of the major global glaciers. And then we can calculate the volume using the simple volume equals length times width times height equation, where length and width are adjusted using the thickness. And then finally, to calculate the SLR, from meltwater, we can divide the change in glacier volume by the glacier constant, which was determined by converting the gigaton equivalent of ice melt SLR to kilometers cubed of water. Besides the global factors, there are also local factors which influence local changes in sea level. So there's some local factors like ocean currents, wind patterns, and groundwater that don't significantly influence local changes. What we found was that land uplift is the major contributing factor to local sea level changes. So land uplift has two types, isostatic rebound and tectonic plate activity. So isostatic rebound is the increase in land levels, which were once weighed down by ice sheets. As the ice melts, 
the weight decreases and thus the land rises. Next we have tectonic plate activity, which can lead to sea level rises near subduction zones, which occur mostly near the coastal regions. So the table we have here summarizes the type and amount of uplift experienced by each part. So as you can see, some parts experience both kinds of uplift, some experience just one, and some experience neither. Finally, we uh, combine our global and local factors into a single SLR model, which can be used to calculate the specific SLR in any year. So, using our final, as you can see in our final year equation, we sum the local and global factors. Using a recursive Java program, we then sum the yearly individual changes for the next 10, 20, and 50 years. And these are the outputs that we maintain. Finally, to uh, assess risk, we then use the NOAA's risk level thresholds, which were slightly decreased, and we placed our outputs into these brackets. And here are the outputs we need to The situation for Olympic National Parks is slightly different from the rest of the parks, as it is located significantly further inland. As you can see here, we first calculated the average angle of elevation to calculate the total amount of inland intrusion caused by the calculated amount of sea level rise. In 50 years, we predict that Olympic National Park will not be significantly impacted by sea level rise as it is located over 9,000 meters inland. Using the risk brackets for the other four parks, we arrived at these risk ratings. However, the margin of error on these predictions will only increase with time, so some of these parks may actually be at a high risk rating, especially those located in the barrier islands. Extending this model over 100 years is not likely to yield accurate results given the tremendous variability in expected climate patterns. The second part of our task was to essentially calculate climate vulnerability scores or CVS scores for each part. Six climate related factors were quantified, weighted, and then summed to form each CVS for each part. The weighting coefficients for each factor comes from each factor's relative importance to the overall health of the park ecosystem. As you can see here, we gave biodiversity the greatest weight due to its tremendous impact on both park visitation as well as ecological stability. Next came natural disasters, which have the ability to significantly change both park landscape as well as harm both flora and fauna. Finally, to round out our CVS calculations, we also included temperature and air quality, but due to their relative stability and non-volatility, gave them lower weighting coefficients. A leading principle in the theory of ecological stability is that the greater the biodiversity of a system, the more resilient it proves to be. Our biodiversity score was essentially based upon species richness per biome. The greater the diversity, the genetic diversity, or in this case, the species diversity of a system, the more able a ecosystem is to basically weather any climate-related disturbances or other disturbances. Our biodiversity score, again, was dependent upon species richness per biome, or in this case, number of species present. We then compared this to the most rich biome, which in this case was the neotropic realm, and then scaled the resultant biodiversity score from one to 10, with 10 being the least biodiverse and one being the most biodiverse. Temperature is another important factor as it is critical to the survival and productivity of key representative species and therefore of the ecosystem as a whole. The temperature score was evaluated based upon the percent difference between the average park temperature and the optimal temperature ranges of keystone and dominant producer species. Keystone species is defined as a predator that significantly impacts the biodiversity, physical land features, or climate due to its presence in the ecosystem. A dominant producer is responsible for providing energy in the form of biomass required to sustain the rest of the food chain. The previously mentioned percent differences were scored to, uh, scaled to a five-point scale and added together for a total temperature score. The air quality scores depend upon the air quality index, which represents the overall amount of pollutants in the atmosphere. Uh, the thresholds we have here were evaluated based upon the air quality index values that we received. For natural disasters, we calculate the severity and frequency of such an event current to put a score of 1 to 10 on each national park. Um, as you can see here, um, we calculate the frequency values based upon the average number of occurrences per year. But one thing to note is that earthquakes are not present in this table. This is due to our assumption that the distance from the national park 
to the nearest fault line is inversely proportional to both the severity and frequency of earthquakes on the park. Hence, placing the uh, table values for earthquakes in just the severity table as we have here will be sufficient. To simplify our calculations, we also made the assumption that all hurricanes of the same uh, storm category have the same wind speed. Um, the average of these wind speeds was divided by 233 miles per hour, the highest wind speed ever recorded according to AccuWeather, to put them relative to all hurricanes. For wildfires, we calculate the average acreage loss per wildfire and divided by the national average. The frequency and severity values for each factor were multiplied together and converted to a 10 point scale. The way to sum up these products was used to determine the final climate vulnerability score for each national park. The third part of our task was to uh, manage NPS budgeting and project visitor numbers. The NPS doesn't have endless funds to meet its various needs, so budgeting is a major concern. They have to address facility repair and maintenance, new construction, employee, um, employee wages, up and park promotion. When considering the dangers that parks face, the NPS have to decide whether the park is in danger due to neglect from lack of visitors or lack of resources to combat climate-related decay. We projected visitor numbers in order to shed some light on this issue. First, we had to consider what factors influence an individual's decision to visit a national park. While visitorship numbers do vary seasonally along with changes in temperature and weather patterns, we decided that in the long term, visitor, visitor statistics were more likely to change as a result of socioeconomic factors. We found a 2007 USDA report that modeled total U.S. park visitors based on these socioeconomic factors. We simplified it to account better for a long term scenario, added time evolution to some variables, and then rescaled the model to fit each park's historic data. This is the equation that the USDA uh, report used, where X is a matrix of descriptive statistics for the U.S. as a whole, and B is a matrix of parameters that weight these variables in terms of their relative importance. The factors that we considered were age, gender, U.S. citizenship, membership in an environmental society, income, distance from a national park, education level, and urban population. We added time evolution to income to account for inflation, and to urban population to account for long-term demographic shifts. We then wrote a Python script to calculate this probability of a visit for every year from now until the year 2050. In order to obtain a total U.S. model, we had to develop a time-dependent model of U.S. population. We performed a logistic regression on historic U.S. data and obtained this equation. We then multiplied the calculated uh, population of the U.S. in every year by the calculated probability to obtain a total model. We then had to rescale this model to fit historic data for each park. We calculated the ratio between average visitors to each park and the model that we obtained for the U.S. as a whole in order to get a scaled model for each park. And then to account for the general trend in visitorship for each park, we multiplied this by a proportionality constant determined by the rate of change in visitorship for each park. This is an example of one of the models we obtained for Kenai Flores National Park. As regards NPS budgeting, we looked at the current split in funds. It's about a 50-50 split between new construction and park promotion and upkeep and maintenance. We believe that preserving this equal split makes the most sense, given that we, uh, we estimate visitorship to increase fairly steadily, but the likelihood of climate-related events is only projected to increase as well. So this 50-50 split makes the most sense in order to ensure that people keep visiting the parks, but also to ensure that the parks survive for people to visit them. We'd like to end our discussion today with a summary of what our model accomplished. For the first part, we managed to take into account global factors such as temperature change and ice melt, as well as local factors like land uplift, in order to model sea level change and assess risk. For the second part, we created a climate vulnerability score that quantified the risk that each of the coastal units under consideration was at, and incorporated variables such as biodiversity, natural disaster severity, and temperature. For the third part, we used a probability function and logistic regression to model visitorship to all of the parks under consideration. We hope that the National Park Service can use our, work, our efforts to ensure that America's natural heritage is preserved for generations to come. We'd like to th thank the Moody's Foundation and Science for this opportunity. Thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, so I had a question on this. Now that you've had some time and you brought in a variety of different data sources, but I was curious if you had attempted to validate your model for question one with the data provided. Sure, so as, um, I'll recap a little bit. So our model really um, used 
I smell, uh, well, well, we had global and local factors. So our global factors were um, I smell and thermal expansion. Our local factors were, uh, was just land up. So essentially, we didn't really examine the uh, data provided by the by movies, but we did research a lot and really found like data that we felt fit our, um, our project. Now, the, for the third question with the population, you calculated the probability. Is that a probability per individual to visit a park? Yeah, that is the probability of that the average American visits a park. And then how did you use that to uh, make your final recommendations? Um, for, regarding the budget? Yes. Uh, well, we found overall that the visitors were expected to increase steadily. So we felt that there wasn't too much risk in terms of the drop off in uh, people visiting the national parks. So we felt that whatever efforts they currently have in place to ensure that there is consistent interest in the parks was probably sufficient to maintain that level of um, participation. Biodiversity is threaded throughout your climate vulnerability score. Do you feel that that single parameter should have so much influence? Um, and would you change anything uh, now that you're no longer under the strict time pressure of competition? Okay, so concerning biodiversity, we believe that biodiversity is an extremely important factor in terms of especially ecological stability. Because again, biodiversity is, uh, biodiversity is a main contributor contributor towards both the resilience of the ecosystem as well as the resistance. So resistance is basically resistance to change based on a climate-related disturbance, and resilience is the ability of a system to get back on track. The greater the body, so basically, uh, say, say a wildfire occurs, and there is perhaps a few species that cannot, um, cannot weather this wildfire. However, due to the tremendous biodiversity of a system, oftentimes the system itself will recuperate and basically find ways to, again, uh, return to its original state or, again, show its resilience. So biodiversity is also something that's reflected in the rest of the factors. So it's reflected in natural disasters, as we see here. It's reflected in temperature and air quality as well. So giving biodiversity this larger weight was something that we definitely intended to do. However, uh, mentioning the exact weights that we gave for each factor, the exact weights uh, were definitely more qualitatively decided. Um, however, given more time, we would definitely find a way to better quantify the weights and better justify the weights that we give for each factor. Um, could you back up a couple slides? To... There you go. So that is that. Some of this is data, and some of this is your model. What's uh, appearing here? Yeah. So um, the blue the blue lines show the visitor visitor um projections based on the model, and the, the orange lines are scaled model based on the proportionality constant. So you're saying visitor projections or visitor data, the blue, the actual? Those, that's the visitor data based on the data that we got from those. Got it. And then that the other is your model. And is that a linear model, or is that? Yeah, so it's actually not only a slightly exponential, and we just need that to write the equations on the paper which you apologize for, but it is slightly exponential. Okay, is it this population model that's appearing on the prior page? Is that the one that, if I'm looking on page 16, if you have the paper in front of you. That's a very bad Yeah, it's, it's that population. That's, yeah. and then that's that curve. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Equation three, you give an exponential for the change in temperature. T is the number of years. How far out can you, do you think you can run that expression? Um, well, definitely because of the volatility and temperature, it's, diff it's diff difficult in order to know for sure how long the equation will be in fact for. But we feel like for the, uh, the periods that we got, the 10, 20, 50 years, we felt that this was a, a acceptable moment. Thanks.